Hi guys, so my name is Paul Buitink and I enjoy a lot making videos for Café Weltschmerz. In a, in a bit I'm going to talk to Steve Keen, but first I would like to uh, get your attention and ask you to consider making some donations to keep Café Weltschmerz alive. In the show notes you will see how to donate money or you can go to the website and please um, help Café Weltschmerz make great videos. Thanks. I'm very happy to have Steve Keen with me here again. In June last year, I spoke with him also, and today we're going to focus primarily on, uh, on the Eurozone. Steve, it's great to have you in again. Nice to be back and nice to be spending most of my time living in the city anyway. Yeah, because um, last time we spoke, you, you uh, also moved to Amsterdam, but uh, since then you, you quit your job in, uh, in the UK and mm -hmm. now you spend more time here in Amsterdam. Yeah, I'm still based in the UK uh, as a resident there. I'm, I'm an Australian citizen, resident in the UK, living a lot of the time in Amsterdam while traveling far too much for my own good. Yeah, great. Mm. And you're also one of the, um, one of the two uh, worlds, uh, one of the two, two economists in the world that is completely crowdfunded at the moment. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I began crowdfunding about two years ago, February of 2017, that's when I launched the campaign or started putting one together. And it was initially it was to raise money for my Minsky software, which I'll now be starting a separate campaign for shortly. But uh, because my university was being forced to downsize, by a dramatic fall in its humanities intake. Its student numbers in humanities have halved over four years courtesy of a government policy change. And they gave me a choice of either uh, being working, for, doing four times as many lectures or going on one quarter pay. And I said, I'll take the one quarter pay, thanks very much. And this worked out very well, supporting myself through Patreon. So now I've got the independence to be an independent scholar. Yeah, great. And it's marvellous. Yeah. So you have the uh, intellectual independence now. Mm, yeah. And you can write and say whatever you want to say. I've always have done that, but I don't worry about any university bureaucrat being irritated by what I say anymore. Yeah, Not that I worry too much about it beforehand. Yeah. The reason we um, we sit uh, down again is last time, in like uh, a month, I sat with um, Jeroen Dijsselbloem, the previous Minister of Finance in the Netherlands and also mm. ex-chairman of the Eurogroup. And we had a direct message contact, contact over Twitter and you said it sort of depressed you to mm. watch the interview. Why did it depress you? Well, it's, I mean, I'm glad, for, thankfully, also I've forgotten most of what I saw in that lecture, but in the, in the interview, but it was just the complete lack of capacity to realise that the straits that the Europe finds itself in now are self-inflicted by the design of the Euro. And everything's about trying to make continue with, with the way it was laid down uh, without saying, look, there's something fundamentally wrong in the design. Surely you can see that. And, and the inability to see that uh, was what just left me depressed because, first of all, you, you not only do you have a denial that there are problems with the euro, you have an inability to reform it even once you do get that level of acceptance because the way it's been set up really has been to exclude the populace from making decisions about the economic direction of the, of, the, of, the, of the continent. And that would be okay if the, that direction was successful, but it's not. And you have denial combined with a, a structure that makes it impossible to reform the damn thing. And I just think it's just, it's, it's a totally depressing state. The only way out is to snap it, which you no know, one wants that to happen. But I think the only, only resolution is going to be somebody breaking the euro. Yeah. And what is the fundamental flaw then in your view? Well, it's too many to count, but the, the, the fundamental flaws really come down to not understanding the role of money, not understanding how both the private sector and the public sector can create money and setting it up so that the public sector is unable to do that, meaning that all the money creation responsibility in that sense falls on the private sector. When you have private banks creating money, they simultaneously create debt for the recipient of that money as well. Yeah. And what that means is that the only way you get an advantage, the only way you can get a, a parent increase in your net financial worth out of that is to go and speculate on rising asset prices. And that's what people do. It sets off basically housing bubbles, share market bubbles, which crash at some point because ultimately you can't, the populace can't continue borrowing money indefinitely. At some point either the public or the banks stop being willing to borrow or to lend. And when that does, you have a crash. Yeah, it's also the, your, the main theme in your previous yeah. uh, book, of course. Yeah. But you know, you're, you're part of, uh, of Holland and you live in Amsterdam. So are you also enjoying the, the real estate bubble? 
<laughs> uh, I think I jumped in at not, not too bad a time. There is one happening again, and this, 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 the dynamics that actually cause these bubbles is quite straightforward, but it's completely ignored by mainstream economics. So they, they completely ignore the role of credit in the economy and therefore are completely surprised when the economy changes direction when, because the indicators they're looking at don't have any role for credit in them. But simply, if you think about buying a, buying a property, most of them, I, I bought my property, as it happens, uh, outright uh, with my retirement savings. But most people, when they buy a property, are buying it with borrowed money from the banks. So that's new mortgages are really the, the source of most of the monetary demand for buying a property. And if you divide that flow of new, of new mortgages per year, which is the flow of, of euro per year, divide it by the current price level, also in euros per year, you get physically, effectively like the number of standard houses that can be purchased per year. That's the flow of demand. Flow of supply on the other side is people being divorced and having to separate and that sort of thing. And then a, a small number of houses being New, new buildings are being constructed. But the flow of demand is what actually sets the overall price level. So you've got a relationship between the flow of new mortgages and the price level. That gives you a relationship between the change in the flow of new mortgages and, and the change in the price level. So what you need for rising prices over time is a rising level of mortgage credit, not debt. Credit. Yeah. Debt, debt is the actual level you owe, dollars or euro. Credit is the flow per year. So it's the change in the flow per year that drives prices up and down. Now, you can actually therefore have rising house prices when you've got falling mortgage credit because if you think about driving a car, there's, there's where you are, there's how fast you're going, and whether there's how fast you're going is increasing or decreasing. So you can be driving forward while you're decelerating. And this gets... A human yep. mind has a yep. hard time understanding that, but fundamentally, that's what drives a recovery in house prices. Now, that's that's happening in in the in the, the euro parts of the eurozone right now. There's even a bubble taking place in Germany right yeah. now. But, but it probably is not specific to the eurozone, right? It's no, that, it's, that it's a global is, is phenomenon. A global yeah. Yeah. We've, we've we've let the banking sector create this because banks should exist to find it. The the the, the reason I would be happy to see banks create money is if they created money to finance working capital for corporations, consumer purchases which are too big for consumers to pay up outright, things like a car, as well as a house, as obviously. House, exactly. okay, okay. Uh, but what they end up doing is they don't finance, and entrepreneurs, I want to get money to entrepreneurs for new investments, new technology and stuff like that. Instead, what banks have done over time is they've dropped off the providing working capital for corporations uh, that was they, they they used to have what they call lines of credit, which are like a large credit card. So a, a company like Philips, for example, yeah. might have a, a billion euro line of credit with a group of about 30 banks, and that's the working capital they use to pay wages and buy inputs and so on. Banks found that unpro relatively unprofitable compared to financing real estate. So what's happened over time, they've dropped that, and, and now that's why many corporations finance themselves by issuing what they call commercial paper. Yeah, which are, you know, what's common in the US as well. Yeah, yeah. You'll get a Philips bond, which might last 90 days or 30 days, and then you buy it for 100 euro, or you, you buy it, it's got a face value of 100, you buy it for 99, uh, you, and then when, the, yeah. when you, they pay you, you know, 100 when you, they sell it back to you, that's the, the revenue that most corporations use to finance their operations now, which is very fragile. Um, so instead, banks are just financing asset bubbles. Yeah, and, ba and back to the euro, um, why, what is the, um, the unique flaw then of the euro compared to the, the general flaw <clears throat> that banks create yeah. too much money and it's, at some point it leads to an unstable yeah. situation and it will... In the rest of the world where you back. have your own national currency, you have a central bank which can finance the government spending by buying bonds indirectly. So the government, the treasury will decide that looking at its uh, spending plans for next year and its tax revenue, expected tax revenues for next year, let's say, like a, let's say a 5% of GDP gap. They can issue bonds, and this parliament will vote uh, to whether to approve or turn down the supply bill, talking in terms of the language of the UK and the language of, of, of Australia, where I'm obviously from. Um, as soon as that act is passed, then the central bank acts as if the government has the money. The treasury then issues the bonds, sells them to the financial sector, and then the financial sector and the, and the central bank will be involved in what they call open market operations. If the central bank net purchases bonds off the financial sector, that's creating money. Okay? Yep. Now, there's other parts to the, to the technology as well. I, I think when the government sells those bonds to the financial sector, what it's doing is taking money that would otherwise stagnate in the financial sector, 
will end up in speculative circles and then using that to finance government spending elsewhere. But the government has a role uh, in creating the money in the economy. And if you look at the American economy, for example, over the last 120 years, it started now going from 1901 to, 19, to 20, 2019, of the level of government spending uh, compared to the level of government revenue, and they call it the, the, the net surplus. Okay? Now, over 120 years, the net surplus of the American government has been minus 2.4% of GDP. So it's only running a deficit. If you take out the wars, it goes to about minus 2.2%. Okay? So that even though all, all the rhetoric about balance of the budget, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. the average seems to be for the American over 120 years, which call me crazy, but I think 120 years could be called the long term. Yeah. Okay? 120 years, the average is minus 22 that should be your baseline, a deficit of about 2.2% of GDP. Yeah, and there's okay. extra money to support the growth yeah. of the economy. Instead, the euro sets a level of zero as their target, okay, and penalise anybody above three. Now, if, you're, if you look at a, you know, a long term, the biggest capitalist economy in the planet, for 120 years, despite their own rhetoric about also trying to balance the budget, has been running a deficit, leaving out wars of 2.2% of GDP, then I think the headline should be above three. Yeah. So no. your so your main point is it, it's the eurozone members they have given up their monetary sovereignty. Given their monetary and that's sovereignty, the main problem. they don't have a treasury to back them up at the same time. And and then when you go into a slump, and this is what Wing Godley said so eloquently back in 1992 when the Maastricht Treaty was first, first signed, he said the people who designed the Maastricht Treaty only developed the central bank. They didn't create a treasury as well. That means they must believe that capitalism is inherently stable. Since it is not, when a crisis strikes, the rules of the Maastricht Treaty will force governments that should be spending significant deficits to stimulate the, to counteract the, the, the private sector plunge in spending, will be forced to put austerity. Uh, and the end target, by having these, these targets, the end result will be, I think you said, emigration or starvation as the only alternatives. Yeah. And well, look at what's happening. we've seen, of course. Massive emigration. You've got starvation in Greece, Spain as well. A horrific situation. And it's just because they, they have this belief that the government should be running either a, a, a zero deficit or, in fact, running a surplus. Yeah. But at the same time, before the euro, of course, Italy uh, suffered from a lot of uh, inflation mm. and, and other homegrown problems as well. So would, couldn't you argue then that something like a golden standard or something like a euro standard could actually benefit also people there? I saw a wonderful comment by, um, uh, by the Berkshire Hathaway guy. Um, Warren Buffett? Warren Buffett, pardon me. Uh, Buffett some time ago saying that if you look at the value of the, the, the American dollar back in 1900 and you look at its value now, there's been this massive depreciation, really bad. He said, if you look at the same time, the technology, the UK economy, the US economy in 1900 and the technology now, not so bad. Eh? They said the, the people who've got this obsession with hard money think the real purpose of a capitalist economy or a monetary system is to have something which is given value all over the time. He said, what I see it as is, is a means to increase productivity. And on that basis, there's been a monumental increase in that productivity over time. Yeah. So I, I think, again, this is where, where I have a, a lot of in common with modern monetary theory uh, and saying that what we're about, what the, the, the default way that people think they should evaluate a monetary system is on the stability of the monetary unit. Now, that's important, but if you got the stability of the monetary unit that you had during the Great Depression, when it was falling by 10% per annum in the, 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 the deflation was running at 10% per annum. So any dollar you had was rising in value by 10%. Looks great. That was the Great Depression. Okay. Yeah. So we, we, we have to look more seriously about what are the consequences of these uh, elements. And the obsession, the German obsession, clearly, with low inflation, reflects the Weimar period. Exactly. Okay, the Weimar period reflects when they lost the First World War and France was trying to screw them by the terms of the of the uh, the Versailles Treaty. And this was part of the whole deindustrialization trying to destroy Germany. Now, Keynes wrote very eloquently in the economic consequences of the peace that this would fail for a capitalist economy. What it would lead to was inflation, okay, would also lead to uh, paying their debts by printing my money, which they did, and then ultimately the build up of German resentment in a second world yeah, war. Yeah, he was right. He was right. So the, in, in, in that case... Yeah, but in that sense, that you, so you were saying earlier at the start of the conversation, you said a breakup is, is, is sort mm. of ine inevitable. Um, mm. 
What, uh, what would be the trigger, you think? Well, the trigger's already being built up in Italy in particular, because, again, you mentioned Italy having high rates of inflation before the euro came in. Uh, it, it's quite amazing when you look at the data now, and I always come back to looking at the data. Uh, one of the terms, I think it was in the Lisbon Treaty, it may have been in the Maastricht, I don't know my European Treaty, I, I know how bad they are, I don't know where <laughs> particular stupid things are particularly enclosed, but one element of the, of the treaties was the target of a 2% rate of inflation. Okay. Now, if you look over the whole period from the beginning of the euro to now, guess what the Italian rate of inflation has been? Three. It's about one. Okay. But before the financial crisis hit, German inflation was about one. French was about two. So France was actually hitting the target. Italy was about three. Now, if you have one country running a 1% rate of inflation, another one running a 3% rate of inflation, and there's no possibility of devaluation. Over time it builds up. Right? Over time it builds up. Well, what it means yeah. is a huge competitive advantage for German versus Italy, Italian industry. So what you see, if you look at when the, when, the, when the euro was formed, Italy's nominal GDP is no bigger now than it was 20 years ago. And in fact, since the crisis has hit, they've now gone into massively much, much lower rates of inflation. So now Italian inflation looks less than German inflation. But the whole process has been effectively not so much de-industrialising Italy because it's still a very strong industrial nation, but stagnating it, meaning they can't get the investment funds. They're not doing the development. Uh, and Germany, the reason Germany... Like, Germany agreed to a target of 2%. And then got involved, and a large part of this was wage suppression, convincing German unions not to go for wage rises, hitting a target rate of 1%. Now, if they'd hit 2 and France had hit 2 and Italy had hit 2, there would be no problem. But because of these divergences, the only way, one, one, of the, one of the ways you could fix it is Germany could agree to catch up and to have, try to target a higher rate of inflation. Yeah. That's not going to happen. No. Okay, but um, so Italy could be the, the next... And now you've got a, you've got a party which Crisis. is openly like a, a, a yeah, split there. government, but a left and right coalition, openly hostile yeah. to the euro and, and to, the, to Brussels as well. But approval uh, rate of the euro in general, if you look, some recent ECB research, mm. research showed its approval rate of the euro is 75%. Yeah. And the reason is because it's make, it makes life simple. For us, I mean, it's easy. If I'm going shopping in Paris, I pull out the same euros I can do to go shopping in Amsterdam. Uh, we don't see us getting currency. We don't have to do currency conversions individually. We, as, as consumers, find it quite easy. The trouble is it sets the economic context that is making the whole damn place depressed. Yeah. And this so is 20 the... years now, the euro now exists for 20 years. Mm. Uh, approval rate is 75%. Uh, do you not underestimate then the strength of the euro? I, I think I don't underestimate the strength because the appeal of that single currency is similar to having a single currency over the whole of the United States. And, and the, the temptation is that let's make the United States of Europe, which has always been the vision. But I think the, the level of the, 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 the catastrophe it's caused in Greece and Spain and a slower level, but still Italy, is so great that any idea about let's bring Europe together and form the United States of Europe is being sunk by the euro itself. Yeah, uh, Dijsselbloem said about Greece that, uh, according to him, Greece is not in, not in crisis anymore. But 25% bloody unemployment yeah. rate. That's the, the And 700,000 uh, talented people have left the country. Yeah, That's it's a big it's the, brain drain. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 and it, a third it, live in poverty. It's turning into Somalia. That's a great achievement of the euro. Yeah. And, they, and then and if you look at the level of austerity they plan to impose upon Greece, it's about 40 years' worth of trying to run a, a surplus of 3% of GDP. That is fundamentally destroying 3% of your money supply every year. It's actually, of course, being transferred elsewhere in the Eurozone. Uh, but it, it, it is a... Pro and this is why I, I talk about the, the ways you can create money. There's two fundamental ways you can create money. Banks can lend out more than they get back in repayments up to the limit even by their willingness to load their equity up, uh, their, to gear their, their capital in that sense, and governments can spend more than they get back in taxation. Now, the, the, the bank's doing it, the borrower gets an equivalent debt to the money they get. You borrow a million dollars from a euro from a bank, you get a debt of a million euro. You have no change in your net financial assets. But if your government spends a million euro on you, know, you and your community, they don't give you a bill for a million euro at the same time. So you get an effective net increase in your financial assets. And the government can do that because the government's money is, tr is required to pay tax and it's accepted in paying debts 
and expected in buying goods and services. Now, this so, is modern, modern money theory. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, and I, I'm completely coherent, consistent with them when it comes to their analysis of the domestic economy. I've got my differences with them over international. I don't think they've quite, got a quite bad foundation for international. But I totally agree with them on the monetary, the creation of money. And when, it, when you look at the dynamics of all this, and this, this is where you've got to think in complex system terms as well, which is what I do. Uh, when I model uh, a very simple model, fundamentally, of money creation by the government plus money creation by banks, and I start with a government deficit, a large government level of government debt, you know what happens when you try to reduce, in this model of model one, you try to reduce the level of government debt by running a surplus? The government debt ratio rises. Okay. Okay. If you want to reduce the ratio, have a larger deficit. Now, yeah. that sounds contradictory, contradictory okay? Yeah. Okay. But if you mention, and this is my favourite example, you're going into a roundabout and you go around here and you go too quickly. What does an amateur driver do? And I'm an amateur driver, okay? You turn the wheel more in the direction of the yeah. spin. What happens? You crash. A professional driver knows you get into a skid, you turn the wheels that way and you can control the skid. Yeah. So in that sense, it's counterintuitive. To dri driving a car well is counterintuitive. Ask an amateur what to do, you'll have an accident. Ask a professional, you'll do something that terrifies the amateur but works. Yeah. Similar thing applies here. It's an amateur, ignorant vision of money that says if you want to reduce the deficit, uh, you spend, you cut government spending and that'll cut your debt to GDP ratio. No, it won't because it'll cut spending by precisely as much as it cuts GDP. If you have a if you try to if you look think about the definition of GDP, it's consumption plus investments plus government spending minus taxation, plus exports minus imports. If you reduce G, in other words, which is part of government's, which is part of mm -hmm. GDP, you're reducing, the amount you reduce GDP by, uh, G by, government spending, is precisely equivalent to the reduction in GDP itself. So you reduce both the numerator and the denominator. Then you've taken money out of circulation because to run a surplus, the government must be taxing you more than it's spending on you. So if you look at the aggregate, your aggregate private bank accounts, if government is running a surplus, it is taxing the private sector more than it's spending on the private sector. Therefore, it's taking money out of the private sector. Now, how does the private sector react to a fall in money supply? Normally by spending more slowly to try to yeah, put so money aside. So this is your uh, diagnosis of Greece, basically, Yeah, right? because when you spend more slowly, what happens is, and this is, this is a fallacy of composition, when you spend more slowly, GDP falls. Now, what we're doing, and I see this in the design of the euro, is we think that we as individuals, I can decide to spend less than I earn. Yeah. Okay. But if I spend less, I'm reducing other people's income because what I spend becomes income for somebody else. So at the individual level, there can be a difference between expenditure and income. Now, at the aggregate level, expenditure causes income. They're the same. So if you try to reduce, if you try to save at the, at the aggregate level, it can't be done. In the financial terms, you can, you can save telephones, bicycles, yeah. but you can't save money that way. So the attempt to, impo to impose spending constraints at the aggregate level actually reduces GDP and re has zero savings. Your savings is perfectly matched by somebody else's dis-savings. So the question then becomes, uh, if there is some group that wishes to save, like, for example, the private households, private firms, who else can afford to dis-save so that they can save, because the aggregate must be zero. Now, the answer to that question is, if it's the banks, there's no net saving anyway, and ultimately the banks will stop lending, as we saw in the financial yeah. crisis. But if the government does it, so long as it doesn't blow the economy with massive levels of money creation and therefore inflation and so on, the government can afford to indefinitely spend more than it gets back in taxation, because the government is the only institution in a society that owns its own bank. Yeah. Now, the euro, nobody owns the bank. Okay, so um, that's that's a very clear analysis. At the same time, someone like Yanis um, Varoufakis, mm. also one of your friends, mm. he firmly believes that the euro can still be saved from within by mm. democratizing uh, via a new political movement, DM25. Mm. Do you believe um, that makes any sense then? or? Um, no, I don't. Yanis and I have conversations over this. Um, sometimes since we've chatted about it, but um, I, th I think that the whole design isn't just the euro now, it's the whole political structure of the eurozone. So, for example, in, in the UK, in Australia, in America, laws are drafted by politicians 
voted on in the parliament or the Congress and passed by politicians, good or bad, the politicians can originate. What happens here? Bureaucrats in the European Commission draft the laws. Helped by, by lobbyists, of course. Then they can yeah. discuss it. You know, the, 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 the Euro Parliament can discuss these laws. Uh, then they have to be agreed to by the 19 members of the Eurozone, Euro zone as well, um, or the European Union. And, and those, if the, there has to be an overall consensus before the decision is made. It's controlled by the bureaucracy. It excludes the politicians. The only way that DM25, and I hope it does succeed, because I am, am you know, not an active member, but I'm a, a member and supporter, um, they would have to get the whole 19 countries to be willing to vote in the same direction. And I just don't think it's going to happen. I mean, it's a, it's a grand ambition. And at the same time as that, Giannis is also saying that every country should have a parallel payment scheme. Yeah, he said yeah. that the other that's, day. That's yeah. more sensible. That's, that's, what, that's what he tried to bring yeah. in. And and he made would the it also be your it. advice to the individual member states to um, start coming up with parallel systems? Yeah. Because when it eventually breaks up, then at least you have a backup plan. That's right. And also, if you, because the, the euro restricts the capacity, possibility for a domestic uh, government to create sufficient money. That's yeah, forbidden by law. Okay, forbidden by law. But if the tax system is created, then means of payment are generated, which are not legal tender. Okay, you could decline to accept if you had a tax credit in Italy and you went shopping with that tax credit. The shopkeeper could decline to have it and insist on euros, and they'd be perfectly within their rights to do it. If you go with a euro and you put it in and said, "I'm not going to accept your euros." I'm sorry, the law says you have to accept it. That's why it's called legal tender. It's so, weird anyway that the Eurozone has been set up in such a way that you're not allowed to have lifeboats. It's like a, it's like a ship, but mm. you're not allowed to have any exits or lifeboats. Yeah, well, it's, like, it's like an Irish marriage <laughs> 20 or 30 years ago. That worked out really well for Ireland. Um, so it, 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 you, you, you don't have any potential for an exit clause. And this brings up the whole Brexit thing, of course. Yeah. Well, Article 50 was only written in because they simply had to have it, but it was like an Irish divorce. You know, 30 years ago, very hard to achieve. Yeah. But but do you don't you worry about um, the uh, um, effects on society or the fallout if the euro breaks up? Because oh, of course if I you am. look at Germany yeah. alone, like yeah. the target two balance of Germany mm. is, is one trillion. Uh, so mm. if then Italy um, uh, and other countries would say after the breakup, look, I'm not going to pay that bill. So I fully expect that to happen. And how can we how we can can we mitigate? Because no one is uh, no one you is gotta, waiting, no one then, likes that. So how are we going to mitigate the, the fallout? They're going to be forced. To, I mean, Draghi said whatever it takes yeah. some time ago to initiate QE. Uh, I don't know the scale, I don't know the numerical scale of QE in Europe as well as I know in an America. But QE in the American economy was roughly equivalent to a trillion dollars per year in a roughly $15 trillion economy. Okay, so over 10 years, they created $10 trillion worth, let's say, on the back of what became from 15 to about an $18 trillion economy over that time. If, if somebody needs to cover the target two balances, the European Central Bank can create that money by book entries. So it is just the refusal to do what is accountingly possible that has got us into the state in the first place. And I think when that crunch comes, then the central bank will it'll be forced to do what it's refused to do for the last 20 years. Yeah. So when it comes... It's, it when still it, won't be smooth. Yeah. So, but when it comes to the, um, uh, to the euro, you are advocating for an exit or, or a dexit, mm -hmm. just get out of the euro. But uh, the European Union, on the other hand, of course, that's a different beast. Yeah. We see uh, Britain trying to exit that, with, uh, which is just a complete and utter mess. Mm. Um, what's your take on, on Brexit? Oh, look, I, originally I, when it came to the... I mean, I was reading the polls and fully expected that the, the vote would be to remain. Um, my opinion has been that the European Union is... A, is a, it's, it's, I call myself a Groucho Marxist on this front. Okay? I'm a member of a club. Do I want to be a member of this club? The answer is no. I think the European Union is badly designed, good intentions, but absolutely achieving the opposite of what those intentions are. Its intentions were to bring Europeans together. It's, it's got them at their throats. Yeah. Okay? I think it's got to go. And if the Brits leave, it's a more gentle exit than if a country which is part of the Eurozone left, so I voted for Brexit. Got, they got a quite a surprise the next morning to see Brexit actually won. Uh, and then May, who was actually pro-Remain, comes across and campaigns for the now vacant prime ministership on the basis of leading the country to Brexit. and. I've never seen any person score so many own goals in any in any sporting or political career as May has done. Uh, so she switches sides to become the Prime Minister. Then she thinks she's got Jeremy Corbyn 
by the jugular, so she calls a surprise election, which Jeremy Corbyn devastates her in and turns her majority into a, into a, a minority government. Uh, and then her whole negotiating has been a total mess. Again, back to Yanis. Yanis said back in 2016 that, uh, I think it was, that uh, he's, they should simply not even try to negotiate, put a, put a deal on the table, which was basically a Norwegian deal, and then say we review it in seven years' time, which is after all the politicians that have to sign up off against it would, or have, you know, their careers might well have finished. That would have worked. And he said, if you don't do it, they'll run you in rings. They'll ne you'll never know who to talk to. Yeah. Uh, they'll make they'll ridicule you, make fools of you for two years, and you'll be stuck exactly where you started, which is exactly what's happened. So, so what's going to happen next month? I think they'll probably delay it. Yeah. I mean, the May is in disarray right now. Like today, as we, we would have seen in the news, three Tories have left to join the six Labors have left Labor to form a new group called the Independents. Uh, so May is even less of a majority than she had beforehand. Uh, that party, which is not even a party yet, they have, they've actually, I think, they're, I think they're incorporated in Panama or somewhere like that. <laughs> It's, 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 it's beyond For tax it. reasons. Monty Python couldn't design a story yeah, as funny exactly. as, as British politics, but it looks like they will form a party. And at the moment, they've got about 14% of the vote. And with the first past the post system they have in the UK, which is another disaster, uh, it's likely to be a massively hung parliament because uh, the Conservatives might well get back in now because of these defectors from Labor and the small hand, but there'll be a minority government even then. Yeah. Final point, what's your take on, on the Yellow Vest movement, especially then, of course, in France, but uh, maybe yeah. across Europe? That, that's, that is a sign of just how much work the working class has been squeezed, not just by the Euro project itself, but by the whole direction of neoliberalism. Because one insight that comes out of my complex system model of the economy that I detail in that book is that in, in the in simplest possible model I've built of a capitalist economy with finance, there are three classes, workers, capitalists, and bankers. Now, bankers are left completely out of mainstream thinking. They, they lump bankers with capitalists, which is completely wrong. Uh, but when I look at that, uh, it turns out that the rate of investment is the overall determining feature of how fast the economy grows. Workers' wages are a residual, and bankers... Was, and capitalists tend to fluctuate around a sort of. A, I don't want to use the equilibrium because it's, it's not what neoclassicals yeah. think is an equilibrium, but a fairly constant share of income fluctuating around or, or near that constant level. And as the level of private debt rises, it's the workers' wages that fall as a share of GDP, not the capitalists. The capitalist fall only only falls when you have a, a, a debt bubble breakdown and a total crisis. So what happens over time is the rising level of private debt is paid by the workers. And that's the trend you've seen globally, a falling level of work income going to workers, which is what drives inequality. Even with these low interest rates? Even with low interest rates. And it's, it turns up in the American data, uh, manufacturing wages have fallen from about 50% to about 40% of GDP in America. Uh, it's, it's, it's a trend which is global. Rising debt is paid for by the workers, not by the capitalists, until the economy falls over as it did, as it did in 2008, and then profit plunges at that point. So what you've had is a massive increase in inequality paid for by the working class. Now, Macron comes along and he's got the old neoliberal formula, let's deregulate labour markets and do all these things and the economy will boom. The whole boom for the neoliberal period was caused by rising levels of private debt, fueling huge amounts of credit. France actually had that without anybody call themselves neoliberal running the economy over time. And now what he's trying to do is trying to get a, a he doesn't realise it, it would only work if you could get a credit-based boom. But the credit-based boom that the UK had and America had began when, in, in, in Britain's case, private debt was 55% of GDP. It's now 190, it peaked at 193, yeah. it's now about 160. Macron's trying to kick-start the economy, which would only work if you could have a credit bubble. Well, soon the ECB is going to help again eh, with another round of uh, financing for the banks. Yeah. So yeah. possibly it will lead to, uh, will lead for, for, to a bit more bubble. In, yeah, um, it won't in last France, long. No. So like, but, so it's but, buying time. Yeah, but the, the, the working class has been screwed in France as wherever else by rising level of private debt. Macron comes along and says, let's abolish, you know, cut some of your benefits, reduce your capacity to bargain and pay a bit more in petrol taxes. Well, that was just, boom, lighting a fuse in the politically most sensitive advanced nation of the world, which is France. So I'm delighted by the Gilets Jaunes movement. And uh, to me, it's, it's a sign the whole neoliberal thing is over. And it's starting in the heart of, of European politics, which is France. Yeah, interesting.
Well, Steve, it was a pleasure to talk to you again. Anything else you want to add? <laughs> I think we've got a lot of material there. Maybe yeah, next maybe, time. Maybe um, uh, can you uh, mention your website again where people can uh, yeah, support you? Yeah, I have a, you? A, a, a Patreon, which is a, a crowdfunding system. So www.patreon.com slash prof Steve Kane. Yeah, perfect. And then people can uh, support your work and you can keep on being an independent thinker, not constrained by bureaucrats or universities. Yeah, indeed. Perfect. Thanks, Steve. Thank you.